brings me great pleasure to welcome you to our third and uh, final panel at this year's uh, 2021 ICOCA AGA. Uh, the panel is entitled Rethinking Responsible Security in a Digital Era. It builds in part, uh, not only on the themes that we've covered uh, this week, uh, but also on our 2019 Future Security Trends Workshop, uh, which was our last in-person AGA before uh, COVID came along. So um, it's actually quite nice to have a panel on the digital era online and rather than in person. A few introductory remarks in terms of the theme and why we've chosen this particular theme. Uh, the technological landscape, as we noted a couple of years ago, but uh, many of you are uh, totally familiar with, uh, of the prior security industry is constantly updating. In the past few years alone, surveillance, monitoring, the introduction of artificial intelligence and the digital movement of funds and resources have significantly altered the work of private security companies. So how might technology transform the private security sector? What questions does this raise about the compatibility of international standards with the adoption of advanced technologies by private security companies? How can private security companies be both helped and monitored to ensure the responsible use of technology that respects human rights and international humanitarian law. The question we are going to go through during this panel also quite topical uh, if we build on some of the outputs and comments that we had in the earlier two panels this week. So for instance, on the panel linked to migration and detention and border control, uh, we heard that new technologies, whilst arguably increasing efficiency, also carry risks. More research is required into understanding how the use of certain technologies may impact the human rights of migrants and detainees and what safeguards need to be put in place. And likewise on the panel on Wednesday, uh, which focused on issues of working conditions in the prior security industry, there were question marks and, uh, and being asked about how new technologies will impact staffing uh, of security companies. Will new services or access to new technologies require upskilling of personnel? Will there be a drawdown in needs or physical guarding services? And those two panels already, I think, gave us a flavor of some of the issues we're looking to unpack uh, during this panel. I have four great speakers um, who will uh, sort of entertain us and take us through some quite technical issues, but also uh, put forward maybe some pragmatic uh, concepts for us to take onto the next level of our consultations in this particular theme. Allow me to introduce some uh, quickly before giving the floor to our first speaker. In reverse order, uh, we have uh, Anna Leander, who is a professor of international relations and political science, and also head of department at the Graduate Institute of International Studies, and professor at the Institute of International Relations, Pontifical University of Rio de Janeiro. Anna, it's great to see you, to have you on board. Thank you. Anne-Marie Buzatu, um, who has worked with us previously as well, and also with DCAF, is presently the Vice President and Chief uh, Operations Officer at ICT for Peace Foundation. Anne-Marie, it's good to have you uh, on this panel as well. Tobias Vesner uh, is Head of Security and Law Program at the Geneva Center for Security Policy, GCSP. Likewise, Tobias, thank you for taking the time to be on the panel. And last but not least, we have Chris Kwaja, who's a senior lecturer at the Center for Peace and Security Studies, CPSS, at Modibo Adama University of Technology, and is also a member of the United Nations Working Group on the Use of Mercenaries. I will now turn to the speakers in the reverse order in how I presented them, and give the floor first to Chris um, Kwaja, if I may. And Chris, I think in particular, uh, will be asking you to focus on uh, the report that was recently issued by the UN Working Group on Mercenaries, which looked at the uh, impact of mercenaries and mercenary related actors and private military and security companies engaging in cyber activities. Chris, you have about 10 or 12 minutes. Um, as we have a fairly tight schedule, I will step up if need be around a 12 minute mark if you've overshot. So Chris, the floor is yours and you can put your presentation into full view. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jamie, for that opportunity. Um, on behalf of the Working Group on Mercenaries, I want to thank you very much for this uh, wonderful opportunity. The 
its annual General Assembly of ICOCA, uh, which for us uh, in the working group is an opportunity to really engage members of ICOCA and the world in general uh, within this period uh, to just uh, share with you insights into uh, some of the key issues that the working group on machineries uh, presented at the 76th uh, session of the UN General Assembly, uh, which basically looked at cyber, se cyber security, machineries and machinery related activities in the context of the human rights impact of their activities, which also looked at uh, private military and security uh, companies within uh, that space, uh, that target that, that explores uh, what they are doing, the impact of what they are doing uh, within uh, the cyber space. But the specific focus of our own presentation uh, is the human rights implication of these actors in the context of the for-profit activities uh, that these private actors are engaging uh, in terms of the use of technologies and how knowledge is transferred uh, through these technologies uh, across the world, both in the context of the conduct of hostilities as well as other uh, non-conflict conflict settings uh, across uh, the world with specific reference to issues of violations, including the rights of people to self determination and in some instances, international humanitarian uh, law. Now, we also took time to look at the cyberspace uh, in the context of what we call the new geostrategic arena and that uh, the contemporary categories of actors engaged uh, in these areas are engaging in the, are engaged with in the cyber sphere across several um, several areas. And when we look at the transformation of contemporary armed conflict and the evolution of warfare as it relates to the rapid advancement uh, of digital technologies today, uh, we can see the profound impact uh, that these activities are having across the world, specifically when it comes to the issues of how the development and digitalization of technologies is having direct impact on civilian life. And that the military domain itself is increasingly reliant on digital technology. And these private actors are in the center of this demand because they are the ones that are involved in the production as well as the deployment of this technology across the World and some of the specific cyber services provided uh, by these actors uh, include um, a wide range of military and security related services, uh, both through direct state engagement or non state actors, as well as some of the proxy relationships that we see when it comes to cyber operations. And that uh, the private actors are engaged by states and other non-state actors to perform um, roles or responsibilities or duties or assignments uh, that include, for instance, the conduct of offensive or defensive operations, protection of networks and infrastructure, carry out cyber operations to weaken adversaries, disruptions, interference or destruction of computer systems or networks and exfiltration of uh, information um, across uh, the world. And that these cyber services are also provided outside the realm of armed conflict. Uh, for instance, the whole question of data collection and intelligence gathering, as well as surveillance, the whole question of domestic law enforcement and maintenance of security. And we identified five key categories of these cyber actors. Uh, in, term, in, in terms of this categorization is framed around the logic of the kind of activities or businesses they are involved in. The first has to do with issues of cyber units or cyber command, which is integrated into formal armed forces 
and many of them are engaged or have been described within the context of the informational fight in cyberspace. We have actors that operate outside the armed forces, particularly non-state entities, though they are not integrated into the armed forces, but they provide cyber services to and on behalf of the state. The third category is business entities where private cybersecurity firms, private software and technology work in collision with government that enable them to access information and surveillance programs or manufacture products uh, that may be used for the conduct of activities. Uh, the fourth has to do with advanced pers persistent threats groups, rogue or criminal armed groups that are engaged in the whole question of penetrating cybersecurity systems of states, which and as well as the possession of in-house offensive capabilities uh, for the conduct of large scale cyber operations. And the last in that category we identified um, is cyber militias, and that these uh, cyber militias are also um, involved in the, 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 it's made up of variety of organizations with volunteers uh, that include cyber experts uh, who may also sell information, uh, connect con information connected with software vulnerabilities to, uh, to adversaries or cyber criminals and hold corporate data as an extortion mechanism. And in terms of the regulation of cyber services, now, for the working group, based on what we've seen um, across, ac across the world, uh, is the whole issue that given the opaque nature of this market, uh, information regarding the relationship uh, between companies that develop and sell cyber capabilities and their clients is very limited. And for obvious reasons, uh, this op this, the, the opaqueness or the, 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 the lack of openness in this kind of business uh, is, 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 is quite clear. Uh, particularly when you also, when you look at the vast range of products and services that are being provided and are available for, uh, the, for the open market, which must be taken into account when considering uh, regulation of cyber services. Uh, the market for offensive cyber capabilities is one that is growing so rapidly and is also subject to little regulations which offer an opportunity to, for us to, for, for the actors to make significant profit. Uh, but as a result, many conventional private military and security companies are also developing uh, cyber security divisions in this light because of these opportunities uh, that exist. Uh, but whatever their provenance, uh, cybersecurity providers like more, like, like more traditional private military and security companies are uh, increasingly uh, working with national governments and are becoming extensions of state power and could thus be considered mercenary-like proxies because of the way and manner they are engaged. Uh, when it comes to the lack of openness and that many of the gov of the states uh, today are refusing to take the frontline position of being the face uh, for the deployment of these uh, capabilities. So the private actors become key individual, key groups or entities that are ready to provide these services. Now, we also looked at the whole question of responsibility in the context of accountability. And for the working group, uh, states either by commission or omission obscure their involvement in malicious cyber operations, seeking to gain strategic influence by evading their own responsibilities under international law, including violations and abuses committed by non-state actors recruited for this position. And this concern is further exacerbated uh, by the potential of cyber operator operations uh, significantly undermining uh, human rights. And uh, the use of mercenaries uh, poses a particular challenge when it comes to the question of accountability 
uh, in the context of abuses that occur through cyberspace and in particular across different jurisdictions. And uh, these cyber activities further complicate uh, determination of responsibility for an attack, but they, oh, they do not relieve states uh, from their obligation under international law. And this is something that we, 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 we emphasize strongly uh, when we were presenting at the, at the General Assembly uh, to the fact that states have direct responsibility and accountability when it comes to the role that many of them are playing even beyond the outsourcing of these uh, responsibilities to private actors. Uh, in terms of the impact on human rights and specific groups, uh, cyber activities have the capacity and ability to cause violations in several forms. The whole question of the right to life, uh, the, 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 and you, you, the, the, the whole issue of economic and social rights, freedom of express, expression, privacy, the right to self-determination, and that uh, specific groups are affected in different uh, or dif in, in, in different manner uh, by these activities. Uh, so such categories include women and girls, human rights defenders, migrants, opposition leaders, journalists, LGBTI, and gender non-conforming uh, persons across the world. Now, how do we ensure transparency and cooperation in the context of what private military and security companies, mercenaries or other actors involved in mercenary related activities are doing. Uh, to address this, uh, it is vital uh, to mandate greater transparency and oversight of the practice, including standards and transparency procedures that are clear and un unambiguous. And uh, we call for trust and cooperation among stakeholder groups with responsibilities in the digital ecosystem in order to review and reform existing frameworks and mechanisms uh, that address private militants contractors uh, for the digital age with attention to human rights and humanitarian frameworks and full involvement of civil society. The role that an actor like ICOCA is playing with, as well as other actors that are working with ICOCA uh, in this context uh, will be quite relevant in terms of how ICOCA is able to set the standards uh, both for the operations and how regulations or issues around regulations that touches on accountability and responsibility of actors involved in the provision of services uh, in this context uh, is quite uh, relevant. And the whole issue of increased enforcement uh, beyond borders uh, when it comes to states, international organizations, and the private sector should continue to require ICOCA uh, membership in their procurement practices and contractual obligations, uh, looking at uh, how this issue is quite uh, relevant, not just for ICOCA and its members, but for people or actors that will either be beneficiaries or in some ways uh, victims of the deployment or applications of some of these uh, cyber related tools. Because sometimes it is possible that cyber related tools are deployed with the aim of achieving a peace end, but how do you deal with some of the unintended consequences that defines or characterize or is, is associated with the deployment of these tools? Now, having a clearly defined standard of operations uh, helps in providing a specific guidelines when it comes to the oversight uh, that an organization like a, like a COCA uh, can, can, can put in place. Uh, we provided uh, six uh, specific re recommendations uh, that, should be, that should be examined. Uh, the first has to do with the whole um, issue. Chris, if of... I could, um, Chris, sorry, uh, Jamie here. Well, I'll suggest maybe for the recommendations, given that we're um, just running a little bit short of time, could I give you maybe one or two minutes to wrap up? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. It, it will take me two minutes. Yeah. Perfect. So in terms of the recommendations, we talked about states refrain, refraining from recruiting, using, financing, and training uh, cyber mercenaries 
uh, they, sh they should prohibit such conduct in both domestic uh, regulations and as well as effectively regulate private military and security companies in this context. The second has to do with the whole issue of increased transparency in contracting processes so that where contracts are made, there's clarity and openness in the way it's done. Uh, we should, states should also refrain from invoking national security concern as a yards or as a basis for restricting information or rather limiting access to uh, the right of freedom of people to expression. Uh, we also talked about the need to elaborate the content of an international regulatory framework on, um, on, on, on private military and security companies in terms of the whole question of the provision of cyber services. Um, we also talked about the need to critically reflect how states can operationalize transparency with regards to the contracting of military support services, uh, such as cyber operations and other related services. And lastly, we also talked about, we also made a point that states must investigate, prosecute and sanction the international human rights law, as well as the international uh, human rights violations resulting from the activities of private military and security companies and other mercenaries that are involved in the provision of these services where infractions or violations of human rights are reported or recorded. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. That was a uh... I think a great summary of a fairly uh, lengthy report. Can I suggest if you have the link to the report, uh, feel free to put it in the chat, or if you want to send it through to the secretariat, we can put it in the chat as well, uh, so that speakers, uh, so that participants can actually pick it up and download it as well. I won't try to summarise what you've just said because there's a huge number of issues there, um, but I've certainly picked up on questions of transparency, uh, and I think some of the experiences from the IHO, the military side of the house, which I think yeah. I know Tobias will touch upon as well. Um, and I think the question of surveillance and data collection are linked to the sort of business entities' uh, responsibilities. And what I did find, I think that could create, uh, it's an interesting label, cyber mercenaries, um, and how that might be unpacked, interpreted, or used uh, in the sort of months and years ahead uh, will be interesting as well. And I no doubt there will be critics out there looking at that term and trying to understand what it means fully. But, Chris, that was fantastic. Thank you very much for that uh, and uh, for Thank sharing you, the report, if you can. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'll share the report. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so um, following on from Chris, I'm actually going to turn now to Tobias. And I think um, it's a quite nice segue we're making here to the extent that the Working Group on Mercenaries report spoke a lot about the military side of the house as well and sort of IHL references and had a large focus on cyber in particular, not necessarily new technologies, but cyber. And Tobias, I gather from your uh, sort of uh, work, you've been looking at uh, issues of technology, protection of civilians, artificial intelligence, more in the sphere of, let's say, the IHL, the humanitarian law uh, sphere, the military experiences. Um, but many do say that the experiences and the issues that we have in that domain are likely to carry over into the so-called business private security domain as well, potentially. Um, so with that, I'll allow you to address some of these issues, the dilemmas, and issues linked to sort of protection and potential harm uh, from your experience and vantage point. If you have a PowerPoint, please share it uh, and allow you to do that. And again, likewise, 10, 12 minutes if possible. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jamie. Thank you very much for, for, for these words. Also, thank you very much for inviting me to, to this uh, fantastic panel. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon or good evening or good morning, whatever applies to you. I'm very uh, delighted uh, to be here uh, with you and uh, among you. As Jamie has said, I'll just uh, share my, my screen. So I'll quickly... Yep. Uh, screen is shared, just perfect. That's it. Great, thank you very much. And also, as, as Jamie has said and asked me um, to, to, to do, um, I'm going to focus in the next two, 10 uh, minutes um, on, on the military use of new technologies, of digital technologies, in particular, uh, cyber and artificial intelligence. So a technology that, a digital technology that is really here present and maybe one that is really where we're, we are uh, going uh, to. And what I'm uh, gonna do is I'm gonna uh, look at the normative uh, framework that has been uh, used, developed, applied, uh, et cetera, and really take it from there to then look at issues 
uh, that that arise and also uh, potential gaps and and solutions that can uh, uh, be found uh, among uh, the private sector uh, so really uh, steps uh, and, and a set of ideas uh, for next steps uh, that could be uh, undertaken I was asked to be uh, very brief so so what I'm going to do uh, every time for cyber and then for AI is give a quick concise um, overview and then uh, provide uh, uh, some some thoughts, ideas, uh, recommendations. So, starting with 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 cyber, I think we were, we're all pretty familiar. We had a great presentation by Chris just now. Um, so, so military cyber operations that is really reality. Um, in two thousand eight, uh, we said there 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 was probably the first uh, cyber war between uh, Russia and Georgia uh, that we've seen ever since. The military uh, continued to to use uh, a cyber cyber tools for conducting operations. On the other hand. We also know, and we've heard it well before, that the term military cyber operations is probably uh, too narrow because oftentimes it's more about state-supported uh, cyber operations conducted by uh, uh, cyber mercenaries or, or uh, other non-state actors, however you uh, want to want to call it. So it's very, very, very present. And the military component, where it's really a formal military like cyber commands, etc., is, I would argue, uh, a rather rather limited, but at least uh, what is sure is it's not uh, the entire uh, story. Looking into the normative response, uh, we've had quite some some progress over the last years. So basically, states realizing uh, that we need to have some kind of normative framework for these actions, for cyber operations, um, etc. Now, the progress has been so far that a large number of states recognizes that we have the appropriate legal framework, and that is international humanitarian law. Now, this is a large number of states. This also has uh, includes uh, pretty major uh, military powers, uh, technologically significant powers. But there is, as to any success story, as to any story, there's always a but. And the but is uh, that there are states like China or Russia, for instance, that do not uh, recognize this. So we are still in 2021, soon in 2022, but we do not have uh, a, a universal legal link. Uh, a universally applied legal legal framework to this. There is another but uh, to this story from a normative uh, perspective, is that even states that agree that international humanitarian law is the legal framework uh, that is applicable for conducting uh, cyber operations, well, even there, um, among these states, there is no agreement to whether uh, civilian data is actually an object under uh, or according to international humanitarian law or not. So basically, we, we have now this very item uh, that is the heart of, 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 of cyber uh, activities, of the digital societies that we have, and this very issue is, is unresolved. Uh, so the result is that there's really uh, a legal and clarity that I would argue is probably the most significant issue uh, out there. So we have a legal framework. It's not universal. It is applied. Um, it, it, it has some promises, but the fundamental issue uh, basically is unresolved, which kind of uh, is, is really a bad, it gives you a bad taste, um, even even if with COVID, maybe you might not have a good smell, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, but it really gives a bad uh, a taste to it. And I think the big question really is, well, what then is the point of applying IHL, if we cannot even uh, protect uh, civilians or civilian infrastructure, um, etc, because it's basically the Wild West. Now this, again, as, a, as an overview, um, and, and, and if you're, you're following and, and still with me, then the question really, okay, this is kind of the state-led process. This is, this is the normative framework. Are there any, any, any with, with these gaps, what are uh, uh, any, any avenues, any, any potential uh, uh, actions that can be uh, under, undertaken by, by the private sector and private security companies um, in particular? Well, there's, there, there, there are four. Um, and I think the, the first obvious one is to develop alternative methods for, for conducting cyber operations. So basically really trying to, 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 to develop methods where you can distinguish between uh, civilian data and non-civilian data or between certain, be, be very, very specific in, in what you're doing, what effects you're achieving. Um, another aspect, uh, especially if we're thinking of cyber mercenaries or even if we're not using that terms, but, but uh, uh, private firms, uh, involved in, 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 in these operations, which is often the case, 
uh, is just to refrain actually from targeting civilian data or assisting uh, such operations. A third one could be a collective effort for reinforcing cyber security. So basically if we're saying that civilian data uh, is, is an issue here and that actually it's not well protected by international humanitarian law. Well, there is actually a, 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 a proper interest uh, in, in protecting this also from a civilian side, uh, because basically a data, this is the current today's currency, uh, many, many, many IT firms and, and, and uh, uh, high tech firms are, are, are concerned by, by, by uh, gathering and, and, and stock keeping uh, huge amounts of, of data, et cetera. So they, there is actually really um, the, the, the proper interest in, in reinforcing cybersecurity. And of course, uh, this has also been mentioned by Chris before, um, put up pressure for a more protective normative framework. Again, already out of uh, uh, proper, proper self-interest because this is really uh, the business model. And if civilian data, if civilian infrastructure, in IT infrastructure, other infrastructure is targeted, uh, this has huge uh, ramifications. Now, these four points, uh, they're heavily drawn on uh, Jeffrey Biller and Timothy Coins, um, a forthcoming chapter in a, in a book I'm, I'm editing. And if you're interested in, in more details, uh, it will come out next year. So, so, so maybe we can um, pick up the ball uh, uh, there if you're more interested. Now then going further to military artif artificial intelligence, so a step further, uh, AI that will be used uh, as such, but also especially for, for, for cyber uh, operations and activities. I think uh, AI, there's still uh, some that say there's a myth uh, with AI, um, with, with machine learning, et cetera, that we're, we're, we're not that far yet, uh, that we're not yet with this technology beyond uh, uh, certain, certain activities in, in, in laboratories. Um, I think uh, that that is all to be debated. Um, what is uh, certain, however, is that artificial uh, intelligence is really, really in the rise and, and states are moving forward in the military uh, sphere and it's, it's everywhere. So it's not uh, only about lethal autonomous weapon systems, but it's about uh, information uh, gathering, reconnaissance, analysis. It's about command and control, drones, even targeting activities. And as you see on the picture on the right uh, at the bottom, also with the coordination and use of, of, of drone swarms, uh, for instance, have we seen uh, at the beginning, beginning of the year uh, in, in Israel and, and Gaza. So basically just artificial intelligence that is, that is rising. But with that also certain issues, and especially the question of how much um, decision-making power can we delegate to an algorithm. Now again, a brief overview of the, 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 the normative framework here. A couple of states have moved uh, forward and here the answer uh, that has been brought forward are ethical uh, principles, especially the United States, uh, France, Australia uh, have, have, have have adopted ethical principles. NATO very recently um, have also adopted uh, uh, ethical uh, principles. And these are also in line with the 11 guiding principles that the UN uh, group of governmental experts on lethal autonomous weapon systems that are working in, in Geneva um, have, have adopted. What you can see, and this is kind of, this is not one single document. What, what, I'm, what I'm representing here, this is really kind of merging what the different uh, principles uh, are coming out, and they're kind of kind of converging around five things. The first one is responsibility, so the the question of accountability and who is responsible. The second one, the the green one, is reliability, question of safetyness and robustness of a system. Um, the third one, uh, turquoise, is equitability, so the question of uh, how biased is a system or is it not biased. The fourth is traceability. Others, the, the, the dark blue one, others talk of explainability. So the question of can you actually uh, understand what a system is doing or is it just a black box that does something and you don't know what it's doing? And the last one, I would argue the most important one, the governability. So here, especially uh, those of you uh, really familiar uh, with, with the debates about lethal autonomous weapon systems, but in AI in general, the question of human control and how much do we have human oversight and can actually influence and, and supervise uh, these uh, systems. So here, kind of again, progress, we have ethical principles coming forward, but again, the but, uh, the other side of the story. And the big but, of course, is that these are a couple of Western states uh, that have applied uh, uh, these, these systems, uh, I'm sorry, these principles. 
And the other but, of course, is these are nice principles. Uh, but the, the more you talk with people, the more that they will tell you, we just don't really know what they mean. And the question of implementation actually is really, really a big issue here. So I would say these are really first baby steps. Uh, uh, and I hope they will lead to, to further steps, uh, but they're still just um, baby steps. So here then again, the question, well, is there a role actually uh, for the private sector uh, for private uh, security company? I think the first one, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious, uh, but I think it's, it's probably the, the hardest one is there is a role to find technical solutions for implementing these principles. Currently, we have these principles. Um, they, 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 they sound good. They're, they're, they're thought through, et cetera, et cetera. But the question is really how can you implement them from a technical uh, point of view? And it's really the, the question of uh, the technique that has to uh, be, be able to, to, to live up to these uh, uh, principles to be operational. Now, a second one, and I think this is this is interesting, especially uh, given this forum. Um, what one aspect could be to develop own ethical principles, like the code of conduct, for instance. Uh, so basically, not just delegate this to states and 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 have that regulation and be concerned, but also uh, having having proper uh, principles. Third one is to develop technical standards and the IEE, for instance, is, a, is an entity that is already working on that in the civilian sphere, uh, making progress uh, in, in that sense. Uh, but uh, I think this is very important, like with the ethical principles in general, this is really uh, driven for the civilian uh, applications of, of AI. Uh, the same thing with the ethical principles. There are 80 different ethical principles, around 80 ethical principles in the civilian sphere, but in the military, we're really, really lacking. Uh, uh, behind uh, there. So there's really uh, opportunities there. And the fourth, uh, maybe uh, the, an extreme one, but I think still one to consider is to simply refrain from working with states that do not have a proper normative uh, framework, whatever you may judge a proper normative framework um, is. So these kind of as, 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 as food for thought, as kind of ideas how this normative gap from the military side with these digital uh, technologies in cyber specifically and AI uh, specifically, how it looks and maybe, um, as I said, a couple of, 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 of ideas to, to move forward. Now, if there's one takeaway and maybe you should start with a takeaway, but I, I will just uh, end. And I think the private sector here, however you define it, whatever field you are working in, I think holds really, really the keys uh, to these technologies. The, there has been, uh, really a, a, a change in the defense industry and in, in also with, with private security companies, et cetera, um, that, that you really see uh, that it's really the firms, it's really the private sector that is developing these, these technologies, that is moving forward, that has the expertise, um, et cetera. And so I think with that, the private sector really holds the keys uh, for these new technologies, but also for the proper use uh, of these future technologies. And with that, the consequence from a normative perspective, of course, it has a significant role to play. In my opinion, a role that so far has not been played enough yet. And so I would say uh, there, there, there's hope, or at least uh, there's enough work that, that we can all do. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Tobias. Um, and great to hear and see the sort of the last, um, sort of the five recommendations in terms of uh, how we can advance, but also the question about the private sector. And I think actually, interestingly, your comments uh, rejoin Chris's uh, comments as well. And we'll there, and I'll see, I've seen two uh, threads emanating, which actually be quite good for Amory and Anna afterwards. Uh, the first thread is that there's that normative legal framework, that gap, and that governments don't seem to be aligned yet, be it on cyber AI and potential issues of new technologies. And the second is the role that the private sector can play in terms of uh, maybe showing leadership, uh, taking responsibility in developing the necessary principles, and making taking a bit of a soft law approach uh, in uh, dealing with these matters and unpacking some of the concerns that we have with new technologies and cyber. So I'm going to move now to Anne-Marie, who's going to bring it maybe down to the level of sort of new technologies, cyber, but from the perspective of your work already engaging with some of the private actors out there and maybe give us a feel of what are the kinds of issues that you are encountering, uh, maybe with some examples, and going forward, how could potentially the private sector you know, tap into 
uh, you know, let's rebound on Tobias's recommendations already, and some of the recommendations from the UN Working Group on Mercenaries report as well. So, Amory, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. We can see your uh, slides. Um, we can see not the presentation mode, but we can see the your mode, I think it is, the presenter's mode. That's it. Perfect. Yep, and you're on mute as well. <laughs> it, I, sh I should know how to do this. I do this enough, but um, thank you so much, Jamie. And I really, um, I, you know, come at the place that I'm coming um, in this presentation, in this panel discussion is really excellent because both um, Chris and Tobias raised some very important issues that, that are really, we're looking at right now and that I'm particularly working at um, in my work. Um, I want to say, first of all, though, um, really pleased to be here. I think it's been three years since my last participation at a General Assembly, but it's uh, something that I know well, and I'm glad to see some familiar faces um, in the participant list. And even if we are meeting virtually and not really face-to-face, -face, but hopefully we will be able to do that in not too much longer. Um, so I'm coming to this space uh, from a slightly different angle from uh, uh, maybe where I have before. Um, the rise of new technologies, um, their challenges for peace and security is something that is really a main um, area of concern for the organization where I am working, ICT for Pat Peace Foundation, which has been focusing for um, going on 18 years, looking at how technologies can be used for peaceful purposes, as well as how uh, and securing you know, the cyberspace in a, in, a, in a safe and secure manner so that we can enjoy it um, with minimal risks. Um, but as we know, and as we are reading in the headlines, um, that is not the case. Um, increasingly, we are seeing um, more insecurity, more instances of, uh, of different kinds of attacks, of violations of our human rights. And um, as was brought uh, and mentioned before, uh, this has much to do with, first of all, the proliferation of different kinds of activities that are being um, carried out and services that are being offered online, as well as a lack of a, an effect normative framework, or at least the, the failure to effectively translate existing obligations, um, legal standards, responsibilities into um, an, an implement, uh, implementable or a um, uh, way of really, you know, in, in cyberspace. So this is a big challenge. Um, but even before we get there in a way, or also contributing to the, the difficulties is, you know, what is being done? Who is being, who is doing it? What kind of actors are involved in these activities? What kind of activities are going on? Um, what kind of data is being collected? Uh, it just brings, raises a whole new set of challenges, which requires some type of um, going down into a little bit more the details and understanding what is going on. Amir, we've lost your son. You've gone on mute again, sorry. Ah, strange, okay. Thank you. Um, so just if we take it with the state of play of right now, um, we have traditional, you know, I mean, these terms, again, there's, this is another challenge is, is really the terms are not um, um, very well defined. There's a lot of gray area, which just brings further confusion and um, lack of clarity to, to these really important matters. But if we look at what we would say, imagine as traditional private security services, uh, many, you know, the members of the International Code of Conduct Association, many um, um, are you, you are integrating software and smart hardware devices into security service providers, as we are doing in just about every area of life today. Um, there are a growing number of private security companies um, that are offering new services. Um, cybersecurity services, different types of, uh, this is something that was raised earlier by Chris in his presentation of the different kinds of, 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 um, of services that are being offered. 
Um, another thing is the increasing number of apps and software programs that are being developed to complement private security services. And some of the examples um, that I've heard about, uh, for example, are apps that help uh, that will map the, the layout of a building um, in which maybe employers or employees are working. And then in the event of some type of security incident, it provides them an exit route through the building so that they can get out you know, the shortest uh, route possible. Um, there are also, of course, uh, numerous apps around different security that evaluate different security situations in different areas um, that, that are being used by clients um, on a subscription service. Um, there's just a plethora of different types of apps that are being developed and used um, and marketed as part of private security offerings, um, which are, you know, have the goal to secure, of course, um, to make things more secure and to, to help with uh, the um, clients and their own security. But at the same time, um, there's also in using these apps, there's just an enormous amount of data that is being generated. Um, it's being often stored, um, used, um, for purposes that are not always clear. And um, I think it's that's something that's already come up several times and that I will uh, talk about again. Uh, this lack of transparency, this lack, uh, these kind of um, silos in which information seems to disappear or which uh, it's stored or it's not even clear who owns the information. This is something that is of concern. So because of um, the, uh, this kind of situation where there is an, an, just an explosion of uh, different um, services and activities being used also within the private security industry, my organization has uh, taken a, uh, undertaken a study, which is being supported by the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs to do a mapping study of these types of, of, of these, what's going on in the sector. And so just if I want to highlight a few things that we have come in our initial desk research of, of what's going on in the private security uh, sec the sector and use of new technologies, we're seeing services such as cyber threat assessments, um, security of industrial control systems. And that is a particularly important uh, uh, service because obviously the ind the industrial control systems are often this are the systems that are controlling many of our important critical infrastructure installations. Um, services such as cyber secure positioning, navigation, timing, using different types of wireless technologies um, can help with uh, different things such as drones and other uh, robotics, and of course the use of drones and other robotics in serv security services biometrics, um, development of apps for surveillance and personal security, just as I said, and then more generally cybersecurity services, which is not very well defined. It's a big word. It can signify many different kinds of things, which I think is one of the reasons why uh, there is a lack of clarity around what is going on. But if I were to, to put some words around cybersecurity, I would characterize it as the kinds of services to secure computer systems and other internet connected and smart devices um, against attacks to try to uh, you know, protect the data of those systems. But again, this can go even much further and um, contributes to the general lack of clarity around what is going on. And these pose, um, a lot of challenges, um, you know, now more and more, uh, as we are all using uh, programs, devices, uh, computers, smartphones that use sophisticated algorithms, um, which are collecting a lot of data and almost certainly more data that, than is required or that should be required 
um, in the delivery of certain services, which certainly generates concerns, um, particularly human rights concerns. Um, the lack of transparency regarding the collection of information and its new uses. And, um, and I also think that this goes to um, the fact that it's not always clear what information is being connected, uh, co collected. We have devices, we are, we are you know, using them to uh, say, navigate to different sites on the internet. Um, we have our email, we use our different ways of um, sending messages and information. And there's a tremendous amount of information that's being collected there. And it's not always clear what is being collected, uh, who has access to that information, what is done with that information. Um, and just very along similar lines, a lack of coherent standards for how this information is kept, secure, stored, and for how long. Um, also was mentioned um, earlier, the lack of consensus on how existing regulatory frameworks apply. And certainly at the international level, there's a lot of discussion that is happening. Um, Tobias mentioned a little bit about the the lack of consensus around the application of international humanitarian law uh, to cyberspace. Uh, this is this is a big uh, issue, along with many other um, just say lack of consensus uh, in the international uh, discussions. Um, currently, actually next week, there is going to be the meeting of the open-ended working group, a new open-ended working group within the auspices of the UN that is going to be looking at a lot, a lot of things around how to oversee and regulate maybe to some degree, uh, or at least provide some types of uh, frameworks, uh, normative oversight frameworks for cyberspace. Um, so far, this has been primarily a state-dominated uh, discussion, although there has been quite significant um, participation by non-state actors, including uh, companies, including um, civil society, uh, academics, uh, technical experts. Uh, my organization, ICT for Peace, has been very active in these discussions and has been really calling to try to have inclusion, more inclusion of private actors, because just as uh, Tobias was saying in the previous presentation, it's really the private actors that are driving this space that are, uh, you know, uh, make causing the technologies to evolve, um, that are, are doing things that, um, that people in many of the, oh, yeah, the UN halls don't understand. And so if we want to have some type of effective regulation, we need to ensure uh, that we have meaningful participation by subject matter er, uh, experts, um, including private sector, including civil society, um, including military. So um, just to highlight that these discussions are um, going forward and that there is a camp of states uh, also including uh, Russia and China who are quite keen on developing a new convention or treaty on this, uh, on the framework of uh, cyberspace. And that this will certainly be part of the discussions that will be happening next week in New York. And then finally, we have the challenge that technology is just evolving. It's so fast. It's very difficult to keep up with the new challenges and human rights uh, concerns that are, are uh, advancing along with this evolution. And so we have to think about how we can react and um, respond in a smart way to these challenges. So as I said before, um, my organization ICT for Peace is now doing a mapping study on the use of new technologies in private security services. And here you have uh, like a, have a uh, snapshot of the overall objectives of our mapping study. Um, we're trying to provide a, an overview of private security services um, using new technologies that are currently being offered and likely to be offered in the future um, to offer descriptions of providers, of their clients, the uses and the different services um, that are being offered to carry out the gap analysis of existing national, regional and international regulatory frameworks to identify human rights risks 
associated with this and to provide recommendations to fill governance gaps, gaps including to the ICOC. Um, just a quick snapshot of our initial findings because we're, we're just wrapping up the desk research part of the study, but uh, no surprise explosion of services using these new technologies. Um, as I said, there's a trend of developing apps that are designed to support security without necessarily um, enough uh, regard given to privacy and human rights concerns. And then there's some important gover governance gaps that we're already seeing. Um, how to define and include things like labs, uh, apps, um, software programs, um, smart devices in regulatory frameworks. Um, you have now something that might be considered a product or a good, that, which is intelligent, which is carrying out um, different types of even analysis or certainly gathering information that used to be done by humans. Um, but is this the same thing as a good as is defined in, in many of the uh, treaties and um, agreements, uh, import export agreements? Um, and so the challenge of these dual use technologies is something that is really important that we need to look at. And also the rapid evolution of artificial intelligence, which was already also mentioned by Tobias. Um, you know, I think this is going to really be a game changer and we're going to see some big um, advances in maybe the next five to 10 years. How can an organization like the ICOC react um, in a way uh, fast enough to respond to the kinds of challenges that these new technologies are going to bring to the um, to the arena, and also to to include to make sure that the ICOC and the association is still relevant and still can do its job. So, in terms of the mapping study, um, I'm, I'm going to have to give you literally less than a minute to get through. Okay, this I'm slide. just I'm just finishing now. So, just to say, I'm going to be in touch. Um, you're, some of you are going to be hearing me from very hearing from me very soon. We're going to be carrying out some additional interviews um, and some online consul consultations, and uh, we will look to publish the mapping study in summer of 2022. So I think that's my last slide. Thank you for my for your attention. Um, please note my email address if you'd like to get in touch with me. And thank you very much. Thank you, Anne Marie. And uh, apologies if I've cut some of you a bit short. I mean, there's so much material. Uh, that's been presented and so many issues. Um, so I thought we'd you know, go over a little bit. Uh, I'm exchanging with others to make sure that we have the time built in uh, to the second session uh, when we go to the closing plenary. Uh, but what I found fascinating uh, with your presentation, anne uh, again, it's the, the same comments about the private sector and the role that the private sector has and the fact that the private sector is already one step ahead of the game in terms of the technologies, uh, the apps, uh, the cyber technology that that, that sector is already relying on and implementing as part of their day-to-day -day practices. The question of personal data came up. Uh, that's come up quite a lot, and it came up also during our earlier panels this week, especially on migration. And there was that clear, I think, recognition as both Tobias and Chris have also uh, highlighted that question of the regulatory gap. So no pressure on you, and I know in a couple of seconds, uh, the regulatory gap, um, the lack of transparency, and the different speeds at which the different actors are potentially working on. Um, so Anna, as the last speaker, I'm gonna to turn to you. Uh, again, ideally 10 or 12 minutes, hopefully uh, we can then have a couple of questions afterwards. Um, and so we've sort of built it up towards you as well in terms of that regulatory piece. Um, I think the three previous speakers have said, governments won't come together, the laws are not gonna matter. So the sector has to step up the private sector. Um, any comments on that or more that you would like to say about, you know, what does regulation look like or could it potentially look like going forward? Yeah. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the invite. And of course, it's super nice to go last. Now, I'm the only difficulty I have now is not responding to all the interesting points made along. But I'm going to try to keep it really succinct and short and perhaps even more blunt than I had thought. Uh, so when I was thinking about this and we agreed, we had a little pre-meeting and I would say something about what the nature of regulating responsibility 
uh, for digital technologies, what that actually is. And when I started then thinking about, oh, how am I presenting this? I decided that I was going to blunt it up terribly just to make uh, some very clear points. So three things that I think we know about uh, and one thing uh, that I think we don't know anything about and we need, or rather more research is needed. Of course, I'm a researcher. So obviously uh, that's where I have to land. It's uh, definitional. But anyway, so... Uh, on the things we know, and I think it actually follows very nicely. I just need to be able to get down my slide. Where's my cursor? Excuse me. 16 centuries into this. Here we go. Now it should work. Okay. Uh, so the first thing, um, uh, uh, there's no escape, escape from digital responsibility, not for the private sector and not for other sectors uh, in security or elsewhere. And it's basically because it's not mainly, of course, there are robots and the kinds of things that um, Tobias is interested in, and I'm not at all dismissing that. But the, the core problem really is that uh, most activities, and I think Anne-Marie, this came out very clearly in your presentation, are now digitally mediated. Uh, literally everything we do, uh, and you gave innumerable examples of this, so I, you spare me everything I was going to say. Uh, but this, of course, means that all uh, private security companies, just as everyone else, uh, is facing the question of what happens uh, when you locate a lot of activity in the digital uh, and actually a lot of decision making in the digital. And I just want to be very clear on what I mean uh, by that, in the sense that once we begin, uh, once we're dealing with uh, very, very big quantities of data and very rapid uh, kinds of um, transfers, which we're doing all the time when we're talking on Zoom, when we're storing data for whatever it is we're storing it from, when we're analyzing, then we actually have to rely uh, on the technology itself uh, to look into what's going on. And so we have algorithms that are constantly uh, identifying what's an anomaly, what's normal, and they pre-select necessarily because the speed and the quantities are such that it's simply not possible for a human to uh, to deal with this. So they pre-select what we then see, uh, and and then usually, of course, there's always a human in the loop that will make the decision and so on. Like this is the basic of uh, literally all codes and it's what everyone will always say almost independently of the level. But the, the, the core issue is that what happens when that goes wrong uh, and you know when those decisions have political implications for security, we run things wrong, we analyze things wrong, et cetera. And there's no real escape from that problem. And I think that's something that most people who work on this will recognize uh, and agree on. So it's not the sort of, you know, outer space, something human robot that takes over. It's simply the logic of digitally mediated activities, which is literally all of our activities. So that, that's the first thing we know in very brief. Um, the second thing we know is that this makes regulation really paradoxical uh, in the sense that uh, on the one hand, and I think this has Chris, uh, thank you, thanks Tobias, thanks Anne-Marie, uh, on the one hand, uh, logically, because the issue belongs everywhere, everyone is regulating. So we have a proliferation of different kinds of regulation at all kinds of levels uh, and across a very wide range of actors. And that's, of course, extremely legitimate because if we can't escape the responsibility, of course, we're looking for ways of dealing with it. So... Um, uh, in the report here by Unity or so an international organization that is also claiming uh, uh, regulatory uh, initiative in the area of cybersecurity. They have a sort of outline in their table of content that I'll come back to that ranges from uh, the technical standards that will regulate this to uh, the kinds of uh, high level UN processes that Anne-Marie was talking about. So we have that complete uh, uh, 
actually it's not only a proliferation of activities, but also proliferation of regulations of responsibility in this area. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, we have a complete sense of absence or the gap that Jamie has been referring to, because actually most of this then that it's very difficult to imagine ways in which we could hold the technology responsible. Like, what do we do? You know, the programmer, of course, there's always a programmer who programmed something and we can, you know, easily, it, the easy thing is when they bat, they program for bad, but a lot of the time, even the most basic algorithm is making selection decisions. That's what it's programmed for. And since we don't know the context, even when that, uh, decision is um, uh, supervised, which means that uh, someone actually is looking into it and it can't rewrite itself. We don't know the context in which it's making it. And it, as I explained before, it has to make it. So we can't really get away from it. So, uh, so we have this difficulty of what are we then going to do? Are we going to say, oh, you technology algorithm, you are responsible. It's not very helpful. We can't also go back because it's impossible to demand of a programmer uh, or anyone else that they necessarily know everything. So there's this sense of a void, of a gap uh, that's really difficult uh, to uh, fill. Uh, and... Um, and that, of course, is uh, the source. And maybe I've added, so that's why I added this little picture here uh, with the uh, algorithm things. Uh, and this is made all the worse by the fact that this sort of sense of paradox, by the fact that by necessity, we have to export a large share of looking into the responsibility of the technology to the technology itself. So I've copied here, uh, a table that I can't explain in detail, but it's from uh, someone called Karen Young, who's been the advisor for the EU on um, the development of regulation of AI, where she's basically classifying uh, different forms of algorithmic regulation. So basically where you say to the technology, you have to regulate yourself uh, because things are so quick uh, that we can't possibly know what you're doing from without. So we build it into the technology itself. Uh, and this is uh, a sort of technical solution, but of course it's in many ways a non-solution because it's just sort of moving the problem a level up because what if that then makes things wrong, et cetera. So we're in this sort of paradoxical sense of there's regulation everywhere. And on the other hand, we have no regulation. So that's the second thing I think most people would agree on uh, in one version of another or another. Now, uh, this of course may, puts uh, everyone in um, rather impossible situation, like how to deal with this, not only for private security companies, but for states and individuals and the online service providers. So what's happening is that um, uh, the regulation is morphing in many ways, and we're trying to find new ways uh, of regulating. Uh, and part of that new way, so of course, traditional regulation, the IHL, the human rights, the uh, basic uh, uh, legal principles, of course, don't cease to apply. So it's, it's a question of layering. They're still there. But to get that the technology bit of this, which is really the tricky bit, uh, what's happening is that regulation has to work on, um, if you can't get that the responsibility, you can't make the technology responsible, you have to work otherwise and try to preempt it from doing bad things, basically. So you work uh, with things, and this is, so this is from the Unity report, but I could have taken almost any regulation in this area. So you come up with all kinds of ways of working with frameworks that, con that are pre pre basically designed to preempt uh, things from going wrong in the technology. So that's one way in which it's morphing. We also know that it's morphing more and more because we know that it's all very contextual. All the different technology, what makes all of this so confusing and so pro is that, of course, it makes a huge difference what, whether we're talking about uh, uh, drones, so the operation of drones, or whether we're talking about you know, the protection of national health service data of the kind, uh, critical infrastructure that WannaCry attacked, or whether we... So all of this, there has to be a sense of... Uh, 
context sensitivity in there. So we have sort of focus on technical standards. So general frameworks that are designed to preempt and technical standards that are adjusted to the context. And then we have a whole bunch of regulations that come in the form of capacity building that are designed to deal with the process itself, the process by which we work uh, with um, digital responsibility. So that's the kind of uh, capacity building tools. And this comes again and again in various forms because the idea is that not only is this extremely complicated, so this isn't about learning about something fixed, but it's changing all the time. Uh, and so we need to sort of follow that change and you can't really fix a rule saying you have to do this and that um, and then it will work because that's not how it is. You have to have processes which allows you to think about precisely the standards and the um, frameworks uh, through which you can work on the context. So this, of course, is a very bizarre form of regulation, if you think legally, because usually we think about holding accountable, you know, we have some basic principles, and then we go and we say, you're responsible, here, stand up for it. And here we're talking about something rather different. And this, of course, has uh, lawyers spend a lot of time fretting of, of about the implications of this. And so actually do companies because they carry most of it. So there we get to, so there are all kinds of issues that one could raise, but I think for the discussion we're having here, what I think one needs to ponder very carefully be, carefully is how to, uh, how to think about the implications of this uh, so that it all becomes a little bit handleable. Uh, because, you know, we can list innumerable uh, complexities and, you know, the thousands of regulations that are around codes of conduct of different kinds of different levels and so on. But how could one think about uh, and make this more handleable uh, for um, something like private security, and, uh, which is what the association is concerned with and the code of conduct. So uh, here I think there's uh, thinking in terms of actually uh, doing something useful uh, in terms of establishing, and this is what one really would need to ponder how to do that. Uh, it, thinking about how to design uh, digital responsibility in a way that makes it possible to see through. And I use the term design, uh, I'll come back to why I have the image from Google here. I use the term design because I think it helpfully directs attention to uh, three core issues that one would need to tackle there. And the first is really uh, the one of uh, what the aims uh, of any such uh, uh, digital responsibility should be. And I think Tobias, you know, I, thanks a lot for you had a beautiful where you said where you did it for AI and said, OK, this is what's usually around. But of course, if one thought about this in the uh, code of conduct context, one would need to specify uh, what what kind of uh, issues one would want to uh, focus on there. And um, and I'm not entirely and I think that must be, you know, what would be the aim of the game must, of course, be the first question. Uh, and I and design, of course, is always about thinking ahead and thinking about the aim. So in that sense, design is actually a very useful term for that. Uh, the second reason why, why I'm using that term is the, um, the, the need for a certain um, sense of pragmatism uh, and uh, of need to make practical. So when we design a house or a building or something, we want people to be able to use it. And I think here it's very similar and need to sort of think about how one could actually uh, not only formulate aims that would make uh, it easier uh, for uh, companies to relate to, but also uh, formulate it in such a way that uh, they could pragmatically work with it. And there's a sort of balance between um, the uh, how uh, encompassing uh, things need to be and how cumbersome they can be. And of course, in cyber, anything to do with the digital, actually, and this, of course, for uh, the members of uh, uh, crisis, for the core concerned by the, the questions around mercenaries and so on, of course, is the huge cost of this. So uh, it's extremely expensive for a poor country to provide digital security for, uh, for example, its central bank. Uh, when they closed the Bangladeshi central bank, it blocked the country for three weeks. It costs a fortune uh, but anyway so there uh, but so you need uh, you need to have a sense Anna, of I'm what gonna give you possible. about one minute that's what you yeah. I don't need more um, okay. <laughs> actually I, 
yeah, sorry, I'm realizing I've gone on too long. Sorry, I said it would be very short. Uh, and uh, finally, I think the the question of um, uh, of how to make it adoptable, so how to make it actually appealing, and that's uh, in the sense that you know people. Uh, you could actually think this through. And I think the private sector, so there's been a lot here about the public and the private and so on. I think the private sector is at the forefront of the regulation of these kinds of things. And I put up the Google thing here. I just have to say one word about this. Since it's from the, the Google actually has a design team. And this one is about how to design racial uh, equality uh, into technology. Um, and these are the, print, uh, the four things I've written there. So it's pretty radical if you think about what that means, how that translates in practice. Uh, but anyway, I think it does more for racial equality probably uh, than most other things done by states. Uh, and I won't say more about this. Uh, I hope we'll have a nice discussion. I'd be happy to come back on very many things that other people have said because I realize I'm running against. But anyway, uh, super briefly, so three things that we really know that is inescapable, uh, uh, that the regulation is really paradoxical uh, and that it's morphing in the way it's operating. And then we, I think for your association, Jamie, thinking through how you could actually implement that and just taking up uh, the points that everyone else has made uh, is where you should really put some energy and could really do something very, very useful. Thank you. Super. Thank you very much. Anna. And you summarized um, at the end as well. So there's no need for me to summarize on that. Um, we don't have a huge amount of time. Um, so I've been a pretty bad moderator in terms of not cutting you short, but I think at the same time, the content of everything that's been put forward so far has been fascinating because there've been a lot of issues that we can look at and you've given us that platform for further consultations. So what I uh, might do, we have about 10 or so minutes left because I know we need to go into the next speakers. I, we have a couple of questions which have come through um, and I will suggest that potentially what we could do is uh, Tobias, you have, I think, one or two questions which have come to you directly uh, already uh, in the chat. I don't know if you've seen them. Uh, if not, uh, perfect. So I'll let you maybe just read them out and uh, tackle those. Chris, you also had a question that came through to you on the international regulatory framework uh, and uh, the offer of an answer there, but maybe uh, you could unpack that as well. And then with uh, Anne-Marie and Anna, at this stage, there's no specific questions which come and been targeted to you, but what I might ask of you as well is, is there anything that you want to rebound on or off that the other speakers have indicated? A point or, or another that they have mentioned, which you think is particularly important, that you either support or actually you find that is not a very valid point. Uh, so be provocative if you want to. So, and with those, I think once we have the four of you speak, and I'm literally going to give you about two minutes each, I'm going to have to sort of wrap things up. So I'm going to give the floor to Tobias first, and then um, to Chris to deal with the International Regulatory Framework. Then I'll give uh, to Anne-Marie and then to Anna. Then I'll give the means that the, uh, the two of you have a bit of time to think about what you may want to criticize or pick up on from the other speakers. So Tobias, you literally have about two, two and a half minutes. I apologize. Thank you very much. So, so the clock is ticking, and no, th thank you to, to all presenters and all panels. Really f fascinating uh, points, and I, I'd love to spend hours uh, continuing discussing this. But, but so I'll, I'll, st I'll stay brief. No, I think from from Peter Obi's question, um, whether private security and CSOs how they can explore data sets um, of AI and, and cybersecurity to create safe uh, space and, and and positive engagement. I think that's a fascinating. Uh, a question. Um, also, he mentions uh, data in integrated analytics. Uh, to be very frank, I'm, I'm not an expert in that. Uh, so, so you're you're certainly well 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 uh, ahead of that. I think it's really a very interesting uh, uh, thing. I, I'm really thinking in terms of like compliance uh, compliance programs and and especially compliance programs. Um, concerning the, the gathering, selecting, and vetting of, of, of data. And I think, um, especially in artificial intelligence, you're saying that the intelligence is not the program, the intelligence is the data. Um, so I think that's that's really a great point. And how, how do you, uh, do you have processes to, to, to ensure that you have unbiased data? Um, how, do you, how do you program system to, to minimize such biases? And, and, and how do you deal with data scarcity? So I think those, those are really big, big, big questions um, that, that that you really need procedures, kind of type of uh, compliance pr procedures. And the states, uh, at least I know from the military, 
um, they, they're really working hard on that because they really know that that getting the data and storing the data and managing and, and preventing hacks, et cetera, is really the, the essence of, of, of the activity. So I think that's interesting. On, on Beatrice uh, Godfrey's uh, question regarding uh, um, trading or, or, or exploring and sharing uh, uh, when firms have internal cyber incidents, I think that's, that's really, really a, a great, great um, approach. Here, I, I think we, we all know that, that firms really do not like to report when there have been uh, uh, IT breaches or information breaches. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's something that could be really, really well uh, explored. And, and thinking in terms of, I was working on, on arms exports um, and the Washington Agreement, for instance, they have um, confidential information exchange among states, maybe something between firms or firms engaged in cybersecurity. Uh, or, 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 or governmental agency that coordinates something like that, where it actually does not go to the public and, and, and maybe there is a lack of transparency, but at least you can really uh, coordinate and share that, that information. Maybe that could be uh, a, a, some uh, approach. Um, and with regard to the question of, are there any remedies? My only thing, and I, I'm pretty sure anyone would uh, echo that, is it's just no, please, no offensive uh, actions, because I think this whole concept of deterrence in, in, in cyber is, is, to me at least, uh, I think barely practical, but, but, but certainly dangerous. So thank, thank you, you Tobias. Again. Um, a lot in those two minutes. And fear not, the discussion will continue after this webinar as we go into next year. So we'll have plenty of time to go into a lot more detail. Chris, you had the question on the international uh, regulatory framework or on the um, how to regulate um, from Calib um, issues linked to the so-called mercenaries, the cyber mercenaries. And your recommendation, I think, was linked to an international regulatory framework. But I have heard from the other speakers as well that the international legal order may be a bit of a challenge in keeping up in these changes. So maybe I'll let you tackle the question that Kelly put in there and then uh, provide your answer to all of us as well. Yeah, thank you very much, Jamie. I think for the working group, um, enacting an international binding instrument or framework that provides all that is required in terms of the regulation of the activities, not just regulating activities, but such a framework should also have clearly defined benchmarks for sanctioning either states or actor, non-state actors that violate uh, the, 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 the human rights. Um, right now, ICOCA is basically the only, the only actor uh, that is able to, in a way, provide uh, some form of guidance uh, for its own members. But we think that alone is not enough because ICOCA is not able to also regulate states. And that is where the UN comes. That is where the European Union comes in. That is where actors like the African Union uh, become very important because these are entities that are made up of states. And if states are able to come together to put in place binding instruments that is able that, that, that a binding instrument that is able to provide these parameters for monitoring, oversight, and sanction, then we are better positioned globally uh, to have um, actors uh, that are deployed, be it uh, private military and security companies or uh, some machineries that are within the the, 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 the the books of states and being used by these states uh, uh, to know that, yes, they are not operating in a vacuum, but that there are rules governing what they do in terms of responsibility and that these rules will also hold them accountable uh, for their actions. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, I think very assertive there. I saw the hand in front of the camera. So um, excellent points there on states and how to basically bring states uh, to the table and make sure that they are held accountable as well. So I'm going to go to Anne-Marie now. I don't know if I've given you enough time to maybe uh, bounce off uh, some of the comments from the other speakers. Uh, is there anything that you want to add or address uh, that came up during the various presentations? Again, two quick minutes, if you could. Two quick minutes. Um, I, what I would like to just maybe say a little bit more about in response also to the question from Beatrice and, um, and what was just said, but now is that there are discussions that are happening now at the international level, um, but it's focused primarily on what we would call a normative framework for responsible state behavior, while also recognizing the importance 
uh, and the important uh, in the area of let's say of effective control that non-state actors have in these types of systems. So actually, um, one of the norms that would be part of that normative framework is to not stockpile vulnerabilities. Um, to and what that means is also to share uh, when there are vulnerabilities that come to the attention of states, but also private actors. The idea would be that that is something that is, you know, it's would reduce the amount of instability um, in cyberspace. Um, how that's going to be done, it's still not clear. Um, this will be some part of the discussions that the new open-ended working group that's looking at matters of uh, state responsible state behavior in cyberspace will be looking at next week in New York. And then in January, in the third week of January, they're actually going to begin deliberations on a cyber crime treaty. Um, many of these uh, types of activities could fall possibly under the um, auspices of such a cyber kind treaty. And that is also going to be um, happening in New York and be going on. And that, these are being managed by different committees in the UN. The cyber crime is under the third committee, the work of the open-ended working group under the first committee. And there's some real competing um, points of view. As I said, there's one point of view that's looking also for another treaty on cyber um, within the responsible state behavior framework. Another saying that we have enough laws as such, but they need to be translated and implemented in an effective fashion with some type of platform that even involves non-state actor participation. So I just leave you with that little update of what's going on at the UN. Um, I'm very actively involved in all of this as well. So I'm happy to, and I'm trying to make the, the kind of the link between these different processes um, such as ICOCA and then what's happening at uh, these other discussions. So with that, um, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being thank here and I wish you all a nice evening. Thank you, Emery. That was a great ecosystem that you painted there. Um, and last but not least, Anna, likewise, you have a quick couple of minutes if you want to bounce off something that uh, someone else said or add something. Uh, yes, just super quickly and uh, along the lines of continuing the, the sort of... Um, general provocation stance here. So I think there's, uh, a, a, you know, we tend to not work with the shifts that's taking place in regulatory thinking. And I think cyber mercenary is a very good example of this. So hackers uh, became information system specialists. We need them all the time. There's a huge market for them. They are actually the cyber mercenaries. Uh, and of course, the fact that we have a market uh, through which we hire these people sustains accumulation of um, uh, basically the accumulation of vulnerability. How do you provide uh, cybersecurity? Well, you encourage people to hack so that you find where the vulnerabilities are and so on and so forth. So, so uh, we're uh, we're sort of 